Now it's ready. Good evening. Hello, Joe and Jimmy say that it's time to go. So we will get started here. <clears throat> Do have a, a few more announcements this evening. Uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, we've got a little slimmer crowd tonight. We've got a lot of parents that go over to uh, Maywood on Wednesday nights to see all their kids that are there. So that accounts for some of our number. We want to make sure and, and, and wish that they have a, a safe trip. Um, so for our announcements, um, we had uh, sent out a notification about uh, our sister Jennifer Enix that uh, had, a, uh, had a stroke and uh, she is uh, incredibly well at this point. Uh, she was moved from CCU to room 378, um, still only allow two visitors per day, and Robin's sister is with Jennifer uh, at this time. Um, let's also remember the O'Dell family. This is Curry and Cheryl's daughter and son-in-law up in Kentucky, and a lot of members of their congregation there at Ebenezer um, have COVID. We also have a lot of uh, brothers and sisters over at Gloucester Street that are struggling with COVID at this time, so let's remember them as well. Uh, Vicki's mom, Eunice Quinn, uh, has been moved to hospice care, and so let's please remember uh, Vicki. Uh, any students who will be attending a Christian college this fall, uh, we ask that you uh, uh, apply for our West Main scholarship and fill out one of the forms outside the office on the table there and please return those forms by Sunday August the 1st. If anyone would like to help with desserts for VBS please contact Aaron Harrell this week. Also the congregation is invited to fellowship and eat after VBS on Sunday and Wednesday evening. Our Vacation Bible School begins this Sunday at 6 p.m. to 7.30. Uh, please note that our Wednesday night service for July 28th will begin at 6 p.m., so next Wednesday night at 6 instead of 7. Uh, remember, uh, men, to enjoy our uh, fellowship and devotional on Thursday mornings at 7 a.m., and uh, remember to bring your own breakfast. The community outreach project for the month of July is school supply drive for Thomas Street Elementary. The list of the items needed is detailed in our church bulletin. Security Team 1 will serve the week of July the 25th, uh, and that will be Landon Wall, Jimmy Oaks, Travis Kraft, Simpson Almond, and Kevin Cole. And uh, Tom's dad, Charles, is uh, in rehab at this time, so Let's remember him, hope that he keeps his spirits up and, and gets on home soon. That's all the additions that I have. Uh, Carrie will introduce our guest speaker here in just a few minutes after uh, Philip leads us in a song. If you would, bow with me, please. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day you've given us. We thank you for the time that we have to come on this Wednesday evening and study your word and fellowship with each other. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for our speaker and the time that he's taken to travel this distance to come and join us. We ask that you be with him in the lesson that he's prepared, and may he uh, deliver that to us. And, and we use those thoughts and those words uh, from the scriptures to better our lives and those around us, our neighbors, our community, and our world. Dear God, we ask that you be with all those who we have mentioned that are uh, sick at this time or recovering. We ask that you continue to be with them and, and care for them. We ask that you uh, always use us to show our love to our brothers and sisters and to our community. Uh, dear Lord, uh, please, please be with us through this evening. Uh, keep us safe. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Chuck mentioned we are a little slim on crowd tonight, so everybody sing out, please. 
The Lord has been mindful of me. Good evening. We are honored to have Brother Joshua Houston with us tonight. And he, I, we just met tonight for the first time and it was really nice getting to know one another and have some things in common. And, and one of the things we have in common is loving Nathan. Apparently they were college roommates, is that right, when you were at Freed Hardeman? And so he um, has been a longtime friend of our beloved Nathan for a long time and he served for the church for about six years in Murfreesboro Tennessee and so he he came away about four hour drive tonight to come and share with us uh, what it means to lead like Jesus so I pray that you'll give him your rapt attention and we ask your brother to come and preach the word Right now, I'm an auctioneer for a living. I don't need this thing. Mark chapter 10, for anybody who didn't hear, Mark chapter 10, verse 35 through 45. Sons of thunder are bold. They come to Jesus. They ask him a question. And they say, Lord, whatever we ask of you to do, we want you to do it. Now, they must have been bros with Jesus. Because not everybody can talk to Jesus the way James and John talk to Jesus. 
And those of you who are parents in the room know that when your three-year-old, five-year-old child comes to you and says, Daddy or Mama, I have a question, but I have to know you're going to say yes before I ask it, you know I'm not going to answer yes to that question. Right? So Jesus answers a question with a question. He says, fine, what do you want? And they say, Jesus, when you come into your glory, which by the way, Paul's there, what great faith of James and John. I mean, they believed Jesus was really who he said he was. They believed he was coming into his glory. They believed that he was the King of kings and Lord of lords, and he was establishing his kingdom. When you come into your glory, sit one of us on your right and one of us on your left. You remember this story. One of us on your right, one of, one of us on your left. In other words, you're going to be president. Make one of us vice president and the other speaker of the house. And James and John and all their flaws would have been better than what we have now, but I didn't say that. You didn't hear me say that. Jesus says, well, those places of prominence are there. Somebody's going to fill them, but it's been appointed for someone else. He doesn't tell us who. He doesn't give us really any information. You can flip through all the New Testament. I can't find who's going to fill those places of prominence, but somebody is. But it ain't them. Now, y'all know people, and people are people, and people talk about people, and so word got back to the other apostles that James and John had done this, and they started getting mad because people get mad at other people. And so Jesus hears about them getting mad. They don't come to Jesus. Jesus comes to them. The Bible says Jesus gathered them up. In other words, Jesus said, all right, boys, let's huddle up. And Jesus said, you do not need to desire positions of authority like the Gentiles who lord over everybody else. In other words, they use their authority to oppress people. Now, in the ancient world, there were two kinds of people. You were rich or you were poor. That's it. No middle class. Rich, poor. And the rich got richer from the poor, making the poor poorer. Right, so Jesus says, you don't need to exert authority like that. And then we get this great passage. You know it by heart. I know you do because you're a good student of the Bible. Jesus says, if you want to be great, you must become a servant. If you want to become first, you must become a slave. Why? Because the Son of Man did not come to be... This is where you talk. Served, but he came to serve. Now, interestingly there, I don't know how your Bible translates this. I told you not to turn there because uh, I just want you to trust me for a minute. But the word servant in Greek is the word diakonos, where we get our word deacon. Deacon is an official role in the local congregation. First Timothy and Titus tell us about that, among other places. But a deacon is better translated as a, uh, like a waiter. You know, you go to a restaurant and the waiter serves you. They bring you what you want. If you have an issue, they take care of it. That's what the word diakonos means. And politically correct as our Bibles are, I don't know how your Bible translates this, but the second word, if you want to be first, you must become a slave. Now, the word slave is different from the word servant. The word slave there in Greek is the word doulos, and it literally means to be a slave, to be owned by someone else. So what's the difference? Service to someone is not only something that I do as a job, like a servant, it is something that I am. It engulfs me, it encompasses me, it's every part of my being. Now in John chapter 6, we're going to get an example of Jesus putting this to work. Now I know you've had some great lessons already this summer. I've gone on YouTube and watched some of them, and some of them have been about Jesus, about how Jesus is the good shepherd, for example, and uh, that Jesus is our role model. And what we find a lot in churches is that we know what to do because preachers stand up here and tell us what to do, but very few times do we learn how to do it. So that's what I want to do tonight. I want to put the how to the what. John chapter 6, we get one of the greatest miracles Jesus ever does. You know two miracles, even if you have only grown up going to one Sunday school class, you know two miracles in the Bible. Jesus turning the water into wine and feeding the 5,000. Feeding the 5,000 is the greatest miracle Jesus does in, in terms of sheer volume. He has another one like it, not quite, where he feeds 4,000, but here he feeds 5,000. In fact, this miracle is so significant that it's one of the few miracles that is mentioned in all four Gospels. Now, in John's Gospel, we don't exactly get 
the context that leads to feeding the 5,000. You look in chapter 5, Jesus is in Jerusalem, and then chapter 6 and verse 1 begins with these words, after this. In Greek, it's mata tuta. After this, or after these things. It's a temporal marker to say, and next. Now, John is kind of annoying as an author. Don't tell him I said that. But he, uh, he doesn't write in chronological order, and that bugs me. And so I don't know what happened after these things until you go to the other Gospels. Now Matthew, Matthew chapter 14, tells us that John the Baptist has been beheaded before Jesus feeds the 5,000. Now you remember John the Baptist, the man that baptized Jesus, Jesus' cousin, and he's been killed. John the Baptist is a very influential figure in Jesus' life, and he's now been killed. Now, I know all of us have lost someone close to us before. And you know that grief does not go away. It sticks with you. It's in the back of your mind. So I can only imagine Jesus and the apostles dealing with this problem, this sadness, this grief of a dear friend and a leader who paved the way for Jesus being beheaded. So, in Matthew, Jesus and the apostles are emotionally drained. They're emotionally exhausted. In Luke, Luke chapter 9, we don't get the beheading of John the Baptist right before the feeding of the 5,000. Instead, what we get are all of the apostles coming back to Jesus, giving a report on their mission trip. And so, not only are they emotionally exhausted, but they are physically exhausted. Show of hands, anybody ever done a door-knocking campaign before? A few of you. Anybody ever been on a mission trip before? That stuff will wear you out. Hearing no all day long wears you out. All you want to do is just go home and get in bed. And so I can only imagine that Jesus and his apostles are mentally tired, they are physically tired, and by the way, Mark's gospel, Mark chapter 6, just pulls all the accounts together. And so we come to John, and the Bible says this in verse 1, And after this, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, also called the Sea of Tiberias. A large crowd was following him because they were observing the miraculous signs he was performing on the sick. So Jesus went up to the mountainside and sat down there with his disciples. Now the Jewish feast of the Passover was near. Jesus, then Jesus, when he looked up and saw that a large crowd was coming to him, said to Philip, and let's pause there for just a minute. We'll be back. Don't worry. Middle of the sentence, we'll be back. You ever just needed a break? You ever just needed a day? I mean, just a day where you could turn the phone off, turn the computer off, not have any emails or phone calls or text messages. Just a day where you could sit in a dark room and say, leave me alone for crying out loud. That's what Jesus and the apostles were trying to get. I'll tell you right now, if you want to be a leader who leads like Jesus, that is not a reality. Because people are people and people bug you. You know, your job would be easy if it wasn't for the people. Your family would be perfect if it wasn't for the people. Your church would be great if it wasn't for the people. And I'll tell you this, if you ever find a church that is perfect, you better not join because you'll mess it up. Jesus is emotionally exhausted. He's physically exhausted. And so he's going to take a sunset cruise across the Sea of Galilee trying to go to the mountainside. And I love this about Jesus. Jesus knew the value of a good vacation. And when Jesus wanted a vacation, he went to the mountains. Listen to me, ladies. He went to the mountains, not the beach. He went to the beach when he wanted to go fishing. Guys, you want to go fishing? That's fine. You want to get away? Go to the mountains. So they go up on the mountainside, and they're sitting there, but guess what? People will not leave him alone. Oh, my goodness. So he turns around and sees this big crowd. And by the way, I don't know how your Bible translates that. It may say great multitude. It may say big crowd. The words in Greek are many multitude. Now think about how big that is. Now we find out later there's 5,000 men. Most scholars put this around 8,000 people to 25,000 people, depending on who you read. That's a lot of folks. When Jesus sees the crowd, 
first thing he does is he addresses the problem. And there is a problem. He's tired. He's wore out. He's just trying to get away. But there's a problem. And there's a pro- the problem here is threefold. Number one, you got the problem of the people because people are people and people get on your everlasting nerves. Number two, and by the way, these people have been with him already. He told them bye-bye on the other side of the sea, and they beat him across it. So he's got people. Number two, we don't get this from John's gospel, but in Luke chapter 9, we're told that he's in the wilderness. It's not called a mountainside there, it's called a wilderness. And that makes the problem even worse for problem number three. The people are hungry, which we find in the question that Jesus asked Philip, where we paused. Pick up where we paused in verse 5. Jesus asked Philip, where can we buy bread so that these people can eat? The people are hungry. Now that's a problem for the wilderness because there ain't no Cracker Barrel in the wilderness. There's not a McDonald's, not even a 7-Eleven in the wilderness. Wilderness is wilderness. So you got people, you've got the location, And you've got the problem people bring to you. If you want to lead like Jesus, you've got to know people. You've got to be willing to work with people. And people can sometimes be a problem in themselves. Y'all know that. But people bring their problems to you as a leader. That's why you're the leader. If people could handle their own problems, they wouldn't need you. So these people are bringing their problems to Jesus, but the problem that they bring is they want miracles. They want things that they can't do for themselves, which, by the way, is what a leader does. A leader performs things that people can't do for themselves. But Jesus turns to Philip, and I don't know why he turns to Philip. Maybe it's because Philip was the closest one there. Maybe it's because all the other ones were trying to take care of the crowd. But Jesus says to Philip, where can we buy bread so that these people may eat? Now, I hope you don't think this is sacrilegious, but I want to ask you to do me a favor, and that is to write in your Bibles. Maybe you don't like to write in your Bible, but just just make one little mark. I want you to underline, highlight, or circle the two-letter word, first-person plural, we. We. Where can we buy bread? A leader addresses the problem, but if a leader addresses the problem, a leader includes himself in the, in the solution. Now, this is why it's so important that when you have parallel accounts, you read all the parallels. Because in Luke chapter 9, Jesus tells the apostles, you give them something to eat. The apostles come to Jesus with the problem, and Jesus says, you give them something to eat. And so is this contradictory? No, not at all. It's just in one passage we have the leader, Jesus, delegating the problem to others, which, by the way, delegating doesn't mean telling someone else to take care of it and then riding them piggyback, making sure they do. Delegating means entrusting it to someone and having enough faith in them that they will carry it on. And if they mess up, correct them in gentleness and kindness, and if they don't, praise them and entrust them with more. But Jesus says, where are we going to buy bread in John? He includes himself in the solution. So, number one, a leader sees the problem before the problem becomes a problem. Here's what you don't see in John's account. You don't see the apostles going around and and, and giving a survey, are you hungry, check yes or no. You don't see the crowd coming up to Jesus saying, feed us. You see Jesus seeing the problem before the problem becomes a problem. A leader has vision. A leader knows his people. I grew up on a farm. I still live on a farm. My wife and I have some sheep. Uh, My parents have 65 sheep. But I grew up with easy livestock. I grew up raising cattle. And those of you who've grown up raising cattle probably think that I'm being blasphemous saying easy livestock because you know cattle ain't easy. The cattle are a little bit easier because, you know, they're autonomous to a degree. They're herding animals, but you can get one by itself and do what you need to do and send it on and everything's fine. And my dad called me the other day. I live about 10 minutes from my dad. And he said, Joshua, I got some sick sheep. I need you to help me uh, work on them. I need you to help me doctor them. No problem, Dad. Be there in 10 minutes. Went down there, and I, 
Anybody in here ever worked sheep before? Anybody? If you have an option between working 65 head of sheep and jumping off a cliff, just jump off the cliff. It hurts less. So we get there and we start wrestling these sheep. I start wrestling them. Dad has the vaccine and he's giving it to them. The way you work sheep is you don't run them into a squeeze chute and work on them and let them out. You just got to go up and grab them. You just got to manhandle those suckers. And so that's what I was doing and Dad was uh, giving them the shot. About halfway through I started smelling a smell. And it was a smelly smell. It was a smelly smell you smell when you know you smell. Now I'm from Tennessee. Middle Tennessee. I don't know what the weather was like for y'all last Friday. It was about 100 degrees and 100% humidity, and it wasn't raining. So it was nasty. We finally get done. I get in the truck. I'm thinking, all right, goodness. I'm going to calm down, get cooled off, and everything be all right. I kept smelling that smelly smell. And I realized it ain't me. It's my boots. Because when you work sheep, sheep make mess. And you step in the mess, and you bring that mess into the back seat of your truck, if you're me and not careful. You want to be a leader who leads like Jesus, you've got to smell like sheep. You've got to get your hands dirty. You've got to include yourself in the solution. And it may be labor-intensive, and it may be hard, but you've got to do it. So Jesus addresses the problem... He includes himself in the solution. And now verse 6, it says, Now Jesus had said this to test him, for he knew what he was going to do. Now the question here is, who does the he refer to? I think the first he refers to Jesus, right? That Jesus knew. But is it that Jesus knew what Philip was going to do? Or is it that Jesus knew what he was going to do, he being Jesus? Now you can disagree with me, I've been wrong before. I think here it's pretty clear. It's talking about Jesus knew what he was going to do. Jesus knew what Jesus was going to do. Which means that Jesus had a plan. There is power in planning. He said this to test him. I want you to know there's a difference between testing and tempting. Temptation is given with the expectation that you will fail. That's why the devil tempts Jesus in Matthew chapter 4. He wants Jesus to fail That's why the devil tempts us to sin. He wants us to fail. Now, I'm kind of repping the home team tonight. Uh, I I went to Freed Hardeman. I have a bachelor's, master's degree from Freed Hardeman. I'm working on a PhD now at Faulkner. Teach some adjunct classes down there. And uh, teaching teaching college classes has been one of the greatest blessings of, of my life. It's been really awesome to get that opportunity. But it really breaks my heart as a teacher for a student to say on their course evaluation, well, Professor Houston just wanted us to fail. The assignments were too hard because Professor Houston wanted us to fail. The tests were too hard because this school just wants us to fail. No, we don't. You're paying a boatload of money to come there. The last thing we want you to do is fail is it looks bad on us. A temptation is given for you to fail. A test is given with the expectation that you will pass. I give my students a test, I expect them to study, I expect them to know the material, and I expect to write an A on their paper. That's my expectation of my students. So Jesus said this in order to test him. So what's the test? Now, we're going to see the response of Philip in just a minute. Spoiler alert, it ain't a good one. But I think what Jesus is wanting here is Jesus knew what he was going to do. Jesus is wanting Philip to say, Lord... You are the Son of God. You just tell us what you need and we're on it. You can make it happen. You want to turn these rocks into, turn these rocks into bread? Make it happen. We'll go gather them. That's not what Philip says. So a leader who leads like Jesus, number one, sees a problem before the problem becomes a problem. And number two, has a plan. Take the time to think through what you're going to do. Now, y'all know as well as I do that church is one of the worst places for that. Because church is a place where we think we have a plan and we get started and the plan is absolutely trash. Because people don't take time to think things through. I'm not saying that about here. I'm not saying it about my congregation. I'm just talking about church. Because people are people. Jesus said this 
to test him, for he knew what he was going to do. I love that Jesus had a plan. I love this too about Jesus. Jesus is God in the flesh, right? This is the part where you nod at least. Jesus is God in the flesh. John 1, 14, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. If Jesus is God in the flesh, that means Jesus has the attributes of God in flesh. Right? Don't you love that Jesus asked somebody else their opinion? Go back to verse 5. Jesus asked Philip, what are we going to do? Already knowing what he was going to do. A leader who leads like Jesus gets input from outside sources. And you may disagree with the outside source. That's fine. Disagreement is fine. You may disagree with the advice that you get. But ask. Because sometimes, believe it or not, people are smarter than you. This is a problem with my generation and younger. Guys, if you're... I'm 28 years old, so I'm going to say if you're 35 or younger, just, just listen. You need to find you a church grandparent. If you go to church with your grandparents, you need to find somebody else. Find you that sweet elderly man and woman who have lived life that you can learn from, that you can love on and let them love on you. Those of y'all 65 and older, you'd like to love on some kids, wouldn't you? I know you would. Because people are smarter than you. They've been there, they've done that. You can disagree. Now, I love that Jesus asked somebody else's opinion, even though he knew what he was going to do. Let's keep reading here, verse 7. Philip replied, 200 denarii. That's a lot of money, y'all. 200 denarii worth of bread would not be enough for them for each one to get a little. One of Jesus' disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, Here is a boy who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what good are these for so many people? A 200 denarii, like I said, is a lot of money. I'm not a mathematician. Uh, I went to Fried Hardeman, like I said, as a Bible major. I had to take one semester of math while I was there, and it was almost remedial math. We called it Bible major math. It's the only math credit we had to have. I kid you not, the first day was 2 plus 2 equals 4. The 200 denarii, denarii is a day's wage. 200, roughly about 6 months, 6 to 8 months, worth of your daily wage. Now again, I'm no mathematician, and if anybody in here is, don't stone me for bad math. But the way I figured it, which probably isn't right, you're looking at, in modern terms, you're looking somewhere between twenty-four dollars and $30,000 worth that Philip is referring to. That's a lot of money. Now remember, Jesus said this to test him. Philip offers an excuse. Philip doesn't offer an answer to the question. He offers an excuse. He says, we don't even... An astronomical amount of money could not even start to buy bread for these people. Listen to me. Excuses are the enemy of opportunity. Excuses are the enemy of opportunity. And excuses are like belly buttons. Everybody's got them. But that don't mean yours has to show all the time. Have you heard this? Don't say problem. Don't use the word problem. Say opportunity. We have a problem in the church that people aren't coming back to worship services on Sunday night and Wednesday nights. No, you don't. You have an opportunity to reignite the love of God in your congregation. At Salem Creek, I hear this a lot. We have a problem because we just built a new building, and our new building is full, which is a good problem to have. But now we have to figure out what we're going to do to build on and and do that whenever we're still trying to pay off our current building. It's not a problem. It's an opportunity. Perspective is everything. And Philip didn't have a good perspective. So Philip offers an excuse, but then here comes Andrew. Don't you love Andrew? He's always bringing somebody. Every time you see him in Scripture, he's bringing somebody to Jesus. So here comes Andrew bringing somebody, and we always look at Andrew as the Savior of the story. 
Oh, good for you, Andrew. You went out and you tried to find a solution to the problem and you found one boy with a sack lunch to feed 5,000 people. Andrew is not the savior of the story. Here's what Andrew is. Andrew is the guy at your job who always has the numbers. Well, I've crunched the numbers. It's just not in the budget this year. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. Maybe it's not in the budget this year. But the numbers are there, right? So what's the difference between what Andrew is doing and what Philip does? Philip offers an excuse saying, there's no possible way on this earth we can do this. And Andrew says, you know what? There is no possible way because all I have found is a little boy sack lunch. Neither one of them express faith in the power of Jesus to make possible the impossible. So a leader who leads like Jesus identifies the problem, creates a plan, doesn't offer excuses, and sees opportunity. And that's what we are called to do. You ever met a Christian who looked like they were weaned on a pickle? Christians are just... I tell you what, Christians are just sad and upset all the time. Smile, goodness, I dare you. And if you smile, you will start to change your perspective about life. And if you smile, you'll start to change your perspective about people. And if you smile, you'll start to be more generous in your spirit. And you will have opportunity. God will send you opportunity which means instead of praying for opportunity, now we pray for God to give us the wisdom to use the opportunity. Be careful what you pray for. So Philip and Andrew both come offering their two cents. I think the hero of this story is the little boy, don't you? You want to be a leader who leads like Jesus? Sometimes you have to sacrifice what little you have. Verse 10. Jesus said, have the people sit down. There was a lot of grass in that place, so the men sat down, about 5,000 in number. And Jesus took the loaves when he had given thanks. He distributed the bread to those who were seated. Then he did the same with the fish as much as they wanted. When they were all satisfied, Jesus said to his disciples, gather up the broken pieces that are left over so that nothing is wasted. They gathered up They gathered them up and filled 12 baskets with broken pieces from the five barley loaves left over by the people who had eaten. Y'all, I find humor in the Bible. And I think it's just absolutely hilarious what verse 10 says for a couple of reasons. Jesus says, have the people sit down. 5,000 men, not counting women and children, scholars say between 8,000 and 25,000 people, and you're going to tell them to sit down? When I get to heaven, all the rest of you can run to Jesus and ask him questions. I'm running to John first. We're going to be there for eternity. We've got plenty of time. John, I would have no idea why he wrote the way he did. I already told you he bugs me because he doesn't write in chronological order. But John gives parenthetical statements. He gives added information. And as a reader and as a student of the Bible, you think, John, so what? So What? Jesus says, have the people sit down. And then, look in your Bibles, verse 10. Does your Bibles have parentheses around the statement about the grass? For there was much grass in that place. John, who cares? Why would you waste ink telling me about the foliage? I think there's a reason. There's always a reason. In the Greek text, my Bible, I'm using the New English translation tonight. Jesus says, have them sit down. Does anybody's Bible say, make them? Anybody's? The word in the Greek text literally means make. Make them sit down. You got a plan. You see the problem. You have a plan. What's the next step? Execute the plan. And you say, well, obviously, Joshua, I mean, if you have a plan, you're going to execute the plan. Oh, you're not. Y'all, I've been in church my whole life. You know how many times a committee was formed to make a plan and the plan never happened? You know what a camel is, don't you? A camel is a horse that was designed by a committee. We make plans all the time, but getting the plans out the door is hard. You know why? Because sometimes people won't sit down and let you do the plan. Sometimes people want to stand in your way. And sometimes that's a good thing. Sometimes it's a good thing. 
And we need to be humble enough to evaluate that. Sometimes people just need to sit down, and sometimes you've got to make people sit down. So why tell us about the grass? Because you never make people sit down in a place where they're not comfortable. You never make people sit down in a place where they're not comfortable. Jesus didn't shove people down on the rock. Jesus didn't sit people down in a dirty place. He made them sit down where they're comfortable. So you see the problem. I'm almost done. You see the problem. You get the plan. Execute the plan. And then you pick up the pieces. Pick up the pieces. Now, why was this plan so good? Because it was touched by Jesus and blessed by God. If you have a plan for your family, you have a plan for your job, a plan for the church, it's got to be touched by Jesus and it's got to be blessed by God. The Bible says, John 6, that Jesus took the loaves. He didn't ask, little boy, break up these loaves for me. He didn't give them immediately to his apostles. He took the loaves. He touched them. And he created something from a little. He made a lot from a little. If your life, if your job, if your ministry is touched by Jesus and blessed by God, you can do a lot with a little. And I think churches everywhere are seeing that today. You want to be someone who leads like Jesus? See the problem. Make a plan. Execute the plan. Pick up the pieces. Verse 13, they gathered them up and filled 12 baskets with broken pieces for the five barley loaves left over by the people who had eaten them. You ever wonder why there was 12? Yeah, eight, between 8,000 and 25,000 people. That's really not a lot of scraps in the grand scheme of things, 12 baskets. Now, y'all, we're good red-blooded Americans. We know we can eat. And Americans waste a lot of food. We've had fellowship meals that probably produced more than 12 baskets of leftovers. So why 12? The Bible doesn't tell us. That never stopped me from having an opinion. One for each apostle. The faithlessness that they had was something they had to wrestle with and stare at every time they pulled from their basket for a lunch. It was a constant reminder to Philip and Andrew that your excuses ought to be flushed down the commode when Jesus is around. And your excuses are the enemy of opportunity. Jesus took a little and he blessed thousands of people with it. So what is your life? What are you doing with your life? Are you, are you giving excuses every day as to why you can't serve God? Are you giving excuses about not being willing to submit your life to Jesus Christ? Remember, you want to be great, you want to be first, you have to become a servant, you have to become a slave. That's what Jesus does here. How do we lead like Jesus? We count others more important than ourselves. And maybe tonight there is an opportunity for one of us to serve you. Now listen to me, y'all. We can talk about leadership. We can talk about service all day long. What you see in the church is somebody who has a need and they refuse to let people serve them. You got to have both. So there might be an opportunity tonight where you're struggling with sin. You came to church knowing that you're a sinner knowing that you stand outside of the grace and fold of God, we can serve you. This body of water prepared that will act as a symbolic reenactment of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And in that act, you meet the blood of Jesus, and it's the greatest laundry detergent that ever was. You can't get cleaner than the blood of Jesus. As I look at the crowd tonight, I guess probably most of you have already done that. That don't mean stains don't get on our clothes every now and then. If you need to pray, have the congregation rally around you, no judgment. But let us serve you as Jesus served 5,000 people. If you need Him tonight, you can come while we stand and sing. Why?
Why from the sunshine of love wilt thou roll Father and father away? Heavenly Father, we're so thankful uh, for the lesson tonight. We're thankful, Father, for Jesus and the example he was to us as a leader. And pray, Father, that we will take advantages of the opportunities that you give to us, that we will take advantage and bring glory and honor to your name through those things. Pray, Father, that you will uh, continue to uh, bless Jennifer and Charles. We're thankful for the progress they've made, and we're thankful for um, your work and, and healing them. And we pray that you will continue to bless them and others that are on our sick list. <clears throat> we know that many are sick at this time, and we, we ask your blessings upon them. We're thankful, Father, for our elders. We ask that you continue to bless them and give them wisdom to, to lead the flock here at West Main. I pray that you'll be with all those who are traveling uh, this week or at camps, that you'll keep them safe. And Father, forgive us for our sins. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.